Good evening. On behalf of our rector, Father Alfredo Hernandez, I welcome all of you to Theology Today, a biannual series of presentations on current theological and philosophical issues. I'm Father Tim Cusick, academic dean here at St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary, and I'm delighted that members of our local community are able to join us in person here in beautiful St. Vincent's Chapel for the first time in nearly three years. I offer a special word of welcome as well to those who are joining us via live stream. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Pour out on us, O Lord, we pray, your spirit of truth and wisdom, that we may come to a deeper knowledge and understanding of your word, the word revealed in creation, in the Holy Scriptures, and in the word incarnate, your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our presenter tonight is Bishop Silvio Baez. Bishop Baez is the Auxiliary Bishop of Managua, Nicaragua, here at St. Vincent's. In 2009, he was ordained. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Silvio Baez. Thank you for the team. Thank you, everybody. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I, I would like to thank the seminary for inviting me to give this conference this evening on silence in the Bible. Some of you maybe are thinking that we are going to, to be in silence for 45 minutes. <laughs> really not. I, I'm sorry for disappointing you. <laughs> there are so many things important seen to talking about this evening. This lecture is inspired by the subject of my doctoral thesis in biblical theology, which was a study on the theme of silence in the Hebrew Bible, that is, in the books of the Bible written in Hebrew. The research lasted several years, 
and I defended my doctoral thesis in, at the beginning of 1999 at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. My research is based on a thorough study of terminology, syntactic structures, and meanings because silence in the Hebrew Bible isn't expressed with a single term, but with a wide variety of words, verbs, and expression. Therefore, this required a careful study of all the terms, verb roots, idiomatic expressions, and images related to silence. The research also included an extensive exegetical theological study of several biblical texts in which the experience of silence was a significant element. The theme of silence has always been of great importance in theology and spirituality. But since the last century, it also has become an important subject for human sciences. In the biblical field, today it is still a topic to be explored and assimilated for both exegesis and biblical theology. Tonight, I will try to present some significant aspects of silent in sacred scripture. Out of sheer necessity, my presentation will be a synthesis because the subject is extremely vast and the time we have at our disposal is insufficient to cover it all. For this very reason, I will limit myself in a particular way to the Old Testament. I will say at the end a few words uh, on the New Testament, especially the mystery of the cross and resurrection of the Lord. I will divide it my exposition in three or four sections. First, I'll refer to the silences, silences in plural, the silences that the Bible considers positive or negative. This is the first lesson that the, the Bible gives us. Not every silence is good and positive. There are negative and harmful silences. Then we'll talk about the relationship between silence and death. Finally, we'll end with a reflection on the silence of God. First section, positive silence. The Bible considered that silence is good and positive only when it enables communion with others, with oneself and with God. Only in this case, the silence is positive. When it enables communion, relationships with others, with oneself and with God. In this sense, silence is positive when it makes us ready to listen. Let's look, for example, at the book of Job. At a certain point, when Job desired to understand the reasoning of his friends who argue with him, he tells them these words. Instruct me while I keep silence and show me what is the error that I committed. Instruct me, so the friends will speak, while I keep silence to listen to you. Job decided to be silent in order to listen. Not all silence is listening, but there is no authentic listening without silence. Listening is an exquisite act of generosity. We sacrifice our own world through our silence in order to allow the word of the other person to be spoken and received with the respect it deserves. In this sense, listen is always a kind of death because my word 
enter into the death through the silence so that the, the word of the order may be listened to. A particular special way of listening is the act of listening to ourselves, whether to know ourselves better, to examine our conscience, or to reflect in order to make a decision. In these cases, we need to be silent. This is the case, for instance, in Psalm 4, verse 4, where a believer exhorts his enemies to come to their senses and change their lives, telling them, fear and do not sin, keep silent on your bed and reflect. Keep silent on your bed and reflect. Reflect, literally in Hebrew, is speak with your own heart. Speak with your own heart. There is a need to be silent in order to enter seriously into one's inner world, to speak with one's heart, and to listen to one's desires, thoughts, and intentions. This is a good silence. Above all, it is positive and good to listen to the Lord in silence. As when Samuel responded to God saying, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Samuel remaining silent to listen to the Lord. Or when another prophet, Abacuc, prepared himself silently like a, an attentive watchman to see how the Lord responds to the complaint he made to God. The silence that disposes us to listen to the Lord is a silence open to a presence, a sonorous silence in which the word of God resounds. Some expressions from the Psalms are significant. For instance, Psalm 37, verse 7. This psalm exhorts the prayerful person saying, Keep silent before the Lord and wait for him. Keep silent before the Lord and wait for him. The Hebrew verb that we have translated as keep silent describes a silent attitude of stillness and serenity before the Lord in order to listen to his voice. In some, in some psalms, this silent listening to the Lord is described with the Hebrew verb damam. Some of you already know the word duma, right? It's the root, it's the same root. The verb damam, which can mean to be silent or to be in attitude of the stillness and serenity. For instance, Psalm 62. Only in God do I find, I find rest. That is, before him I remain silent, trusting, waiting for his word, for from him comes my salvation. This is a good silence before the Lord. The silence of those who, as Psalm 39 say, decide to place a gag or a muzzle over the, their mouth, so as not to sin to their tongue, is also positive. It's a kind of violent silence, but it's positive. Here we enter into the rich theme relating to wisdom in the vigilance of language where silent acquires a strong ethical accent and is presented as an ideal of life and coexistence. Wise people know how to put their hand over their, their mouth, as the Bible said often. Put their mouth over, put their, their hand over their mouth, as the Bible, the Bible says so often and to keep silent in some moment in order to avoid offense and conflicts in relationships, 
to keep a secret that should not be divulged or to avoid damaging fellowship by denigrating others through backbiting and gossip. Gossip. The vaccine against gossip is silent. To be silent. Put my hand over my mouth. Negative silences. The Bible also talks about negative and harmful silences that separate and ruin human relationships. For example, let's remember the dramatic story told in the book of Genesis about Joseph and his brothers who sold him to foreigners in order to get rid of him. Of him. Well, before selling him, the first thing the brother did was not to say one more word to him. That is, they stopped speaking to him. The biblical texts say that they hated him to such an extent that they wouldn't even greet him. They wouldn't even say shalom, the most natural Hebrew expression of greeting. To stop speaking to someone out of resentment, envy, or hatred is to tell that person that, in my view, she doesn't even exist. We all are familiar with hook dramas in families and churches, religious communities, some that last for many years because of a broken relationship where someone stopped speaking to the other person, never again saying one single word. This is a way of killing the other. Stop to Stop speaking to the other person. It's a way of killing the other. Also, the Bible judges the silence of some people as negative because by remaining silent, they do not help to build an harmonious and just society. Scripture condemns, for example, the silence of someone who has information about a crime and remains silent. By not reporting it, he becomes an accomplice because of his silence. There are a lot of text, biblical text. We can think of the tragic consequences of the silence of some church authorities in regard to the abuse of minors. The Bible also condemns the fourth silence to which the voices of person or social group are subjected, especially those who are critical of the prevailing establishment. The prophet Amos speaks of people who defend truth and right in society, but who were threatened by the powerful and forced to remain silent in the courts and in the public place of the city. Particularly significant is the case of the prophets who is speaking God's name, denouncing sin and injustice, and who are threatened, violently forced to remain, to remain silent or driven into exile, like Amos, like Jeremiah. For the Bible, silence the prophets is a very serious act because it constitutes silence the very voice of God in the midst of society. So to expel the prophet, to silence the voice of the prophet is expelled God from society. The Bible is equally harsh in judging the silence of the prophet who when they should be denouncing sin in society, remain silent instead and say nothing out of fear or out of complicity with the powerful or because of, the, of other interests. The Bible calls 
these silent and unspeaking prophets dumb dogs who do not know how to bark. Perros mudos que no saben ladrar. Lazy wet men who love to sleep. There are situations in which it is necessary to break the silence and speak. These are cases in which speaking out is an ethical and religious requirement of primary importance so as to build a society according to God's will. In this sense, there is a very interesting text in the book of Proverbs. In this text, we read the advice given by a mother to her son who will become king. The text is this. She tells him, speak up for the mute. Speak up for the mute. That is, raise your voice in favor of the poor, whose voices usually are not heard in society. And the text continues, defend the cause of defenseless. Speak and judge justly. Defend the cause of the poor and needy. Silence and death. At the limit of human existence, silence eventually coincides with death. With the act of speaking is no longer possible. Death is silence, the great, the great human silence, the final silence, when every scene falls silent, not only words, but also desires, thoughts, and aff affection. In some Old Testament text, the place of the dead, commonly known as Sheol, is called Duma a Hebrew word meaning silence. When the awareness of a life after death had not yet made its way into biblical faith, the Duma, the place of the dead, was imagined as a place where one dwelt far from God and from other person in infinite and eternal isolation where one could neither praise the Lord, as Psalm say, 6 said, nor speak to anyone, neither could anyone speak to me. Duma, it was absolute silence. In this sense, every time we experience the bitterness of silence, that is a light us from God and from others, we taste in advance the eternal silence of the Duma. And in a certain sense, we enter into death. There are, there are silence that kill others. Related to this understanding of death, it was customary in ancient Israel during funeral rites and in moments of personal or communal lamentation to practice long moments of silence. It was a way of remembering those who no longer existed as well as entering into communion with them through a silence that tried to resemble death. Still today, there is a similar gesture that is almost universally accepted to commemorate the deceased, to observe a moment of silence in memory of the person who has entered into the final silence of death. And now the silence of God. The people of the Bible not only experienced God as someone who was close to them, spoke to them, and saved them, but also as someone who often remained silent, distant 
indifferent, and almost non-existent. Those who in the past had celebrated the praises of the living God felt the saved, not only bewildered by so much contradiction, but also deeply pain for having trusted in a disappointing reality. The words of the prophet Jeremiah enveloping the, enveloping the silence of God are dramatic. You are to me like a marriage waters that are not true. Some expressions found in the Psalms are significant, in which the believer feels that God is deaf or mute, that he is silent, that he is far away, and even that he is asleep like a warrior who has had too much to drink and cannot wake up. Hence the abundance in the Psalms of expressions such as this, such as this, you have seen it, Lord, do not be silent, do not be fear, far from me. Hear my prayer, Lord, pay attention to my cries, do not be deaf to my tears, or do not be mute. It's very interesting. In Hebrew, there is a verb that means at the same time to be mute and to be deaf. Or awake, why do you sleep? Do not reject us forever. We could give many other examples. The experience of the prophet Elijah on Mount Horeb is significant. The prophet came to this mountain in a moment of crisis and hid in a grotto, in a cave. There was a strong wind and an earthquake and a fire appeared before him, all traditional manifestation of theophanies. However, according to the biblical text, the Lord was not present in any of these traditional manifestation. In the end, the prophet experienced a voice of soft silence, a gentle silence, a thin silence. First book of King, chapter 19, verse 12. Only then does Elijah recognize God and cover his face before him on the mountain. The prophet learned that God, God reveals himself both by speaking and by keeping silent. The God of the world showed himself to Elijah, Elijah in the absence of the world, in silence, in the absence of all sound phenomena. That soft silence that enveloped Elijah was a voice, the voice of God. It's very important, the sentences, the phrase in 1 King 19.12. There is, the Hebrew text say, a call de mama daka. Literally, is a voice of gentle silence, a voice of soft silent, thin silent, but it's a voice. Paradoxically, the silent become a voice, the voice of God. So the Bible teaches us that God comes to us not only through the word and response, but also through his silence and apparent absence. Sooner or later, every believer goes through the overwhelming and incomprehensible experience of God's apparent remoteness or indifference. The biblical person doesn't try to deny this apparent contradiction or evade it with easy answers. Even when they don't manage to feel God is on their side 
or understand his silence and remoteness, they don't doubt his existence and talk to him with insistence. The attitude of faith shows that God's presence can be perceived and accepted as an accent. At the moment of God's silence, the biblical person continues to trust God without reserve and cling with complete strength to the love of God, showing that experiencing God as a deficit, a silence, a emptiness is already a way of relating to him. A religion of freedom, like the Judeo-Christian religion, is a religion which one necessarily experiences the silence of God. The divine silence leaves room for human freedom and enables us to have faith enables our faith in the face of mystery. Perhaps it may not be true that God is totally silent. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say that God speaks in a different way. Therefore, in the moment when God is silent, we don't need God's word to resound more clearly but we do need to fine-tune our hearing and make our hearts more receptive. The God of the Bible is always a God to be sought and hoped for, rather than a God to be found and possessed. Paradoxically, God's infinite closeness is at the same time his infinite remoteness from all the images and representation that we can make about him. Why? Because all images of God are inadequate because none of them can express and render all of his mystery and transcendence. God's silence is useful for our faith, for, for the church. For instance, God's silence makes our faith more authentic, free from the false images of him that we create for ourselves. The silence of God makes theology more humble strip it of so many conceptual certainties and abstract theories in which he tries to enclose God's mystery. And the silence of God also makes the church more understanding and humble with regard to those who are non-believers. And we are going now to the conclusion. I would like to conclude with a brief allusion to the culminating event of Revelation, which the last verse of the letter to the Romans calls the manifestation of the mystery shrouded in silence during eternal ages. In Greek, the sentences, the mysterium sesigemenon, and the verb is sigao, that means to be silent, but now made manifest. Paul is referring to the divine mystery that was invisible and kept in silence for ages, but now it has been revealed through the Son, the incarnate Word, Jesus of Nazareth who proceed from the eternal silence and continually reveals it. In this sense, Jesus was word and silence. Jesus is not the word, but is only the word that came from the silence, the great silence, the infinite silence that is God. Jesus was word and silence. 
especially at the climatic moment of the cross. In the cross of Jesus, all the positive and negative silence of which we have spoken coincide in a single event. The positive silence of communion, that silence that enabled the communion and held to relationship, the positive silence is present in the cross and revealed in an extraordinary way in the obedient silence of the Son until death, who abandoned himself with trust into the Father's hands. This life-giving silence is revealed above all in the loving silence of the Father, who welcomed his Son at the moment of the death and preferred to remain silent so as not to condemn unjust humanity. The other silence, the negative silence, the harmful silence, the silence that kills, the silence that makes up for the other, the negative silence is present on the cross too. The negative silence on the other hand, the silence that separates and causes pain, the deadly silence appears in the silent fading of the human existence of Jesus on the cross. In his painful experience of the silence of the Father, and in his descent in the, the Duma of silence, Jesus entered into the Duma. Beyond all this positive and negative silence present in the cross, there is a word, the final word. This word is the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the greatest word ever spoken by God not only within the silence of death, but also from the silence of death. It's very interesting in the Gospel, the first action that Jesus did was speaking. And the risen Lord is always speaking to the disciples, to others. The resurrection is the greatest word ever spoken by God. A word that comes not only within the silence of death, but also from the silence of death. The risen Christ is the word that allows us to overcome all the deadly silences that harm and divide humanity. It is also the word that allows us to listen to the voice of God, even in the perplexing silence of trial, exile, or the cross. The secret is to live by listening to the word, as St. John of the Cross affirmed with great beauty. The Father spoke one word, which was his son, and this war he speaks always in eternal silence, and in silence must it be heard by the souls. Thank you. Thank you for your silence. <laughs> the best silence is this, silent to listen and the other. Thank you very much. It's an exquisite gift. Thank you. And
And thank you very much, Bishop Baez. And just a few thoughts that, that come to me as I have been listening to you in silence. An expression that I heard often when I was a child, which comes, I think, in terms of that positive silence from the Old Testament expression in Spanish, yo soy dueño de lo que callo y esclavo de lo que digo. I, I own what I keep silent and I am a slave of what I say. Hmm. And certainly speaking of Bishop Baez, he has never fallen into that false silence of those who don't say what needs to be said on behalf of justice. That's a lot of the reason why he is here and not at home in Nicaragua. And certainly the words that he said to expel the prophet is to expel God rang very true for me as I listened to them from his mouth. I think it's good for all of us in moments of pain to be aware that God is listening to us even when he appears silent. Now we're important to be able to fine tune our hearing and make our hearts more receptive. Finally, his words about Jesus' silence and the passion reminded me of an expression of, and I don't remember what this, those seven silences were, but a piece by Fulton Sheen where he refers to the seven silences of Jesus in his passion. Thank you, Bishop Eyes, for being with us as one who, who knows how to be silent when you need to, but who has spoken the truth with clarity in your homeland and here. Estoy seguro que hay muchos que nos deben de estar escuchando desde Nicaragua y quizás tratando de ver. Entendí todo lo que dijo Monseñor, pero sepan que nosotros aquí estamos muy bendecidos de tenerlo con nosotros y lo estamos cuidando bien para que él pueda seguir proclamando la verdad con amor siempre. For those who've come to visit us again, as Father Cusick said earlier, you're welcome to be with us for a little while in the uh, in the atrium for for a, a light reception, and know that we will. This this is a tradition to have it once a year. We have one of our own uh, faculty members speaking, and then once a year we have someone from outside speaking. Our next scheduled speaker on January 19th, God willing will be someone who is not renowned for his silence, uh, His Eminence Timothy Cardinal Dolan, Archbishop of New York. Uh, so with that, let us finish by giving glory to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Bishop Baez, would you give us your blessing, please? The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, and again, thank you very much.